Hey, how's it going? So the other day I went to the Austin Zoo and Animal Sanctuary with my girlfriend Ashley and we saw a bunch of interesting things. We saw this goose named Homer the Homeless Goose that had been involved in Austin homeless activism in the 1980s and had even been to the 1988 Democratic National Convention. We learned that this is a peacock, but the female here is called a peahen. Ashley conquered her fear of feeding animals with this goat. <laughs> and I learned that marmosets have creepily human-looking faces. I also saw this sign, which confused me. The sign says that the tiger in question seen here, which to me just looks like a normal tiger, is half Bengal tiger, half Siberian tiger, or in zoological nomenclature, half Panthera tigris tigris, half Panthera tigris altaica. But what exactly does that mean? Well, you may remember from science class that life is divided into a taxonomy of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, which is the same basic principle we see here. Panthera is the genus and tigris is the species. But then wait, what's this third thing? The third name here is the subspecies. Subspecies help biologists distinguish between isolated populations that may look a little different but are still part of the same species, as was the case with these two subspecies of tiger, which, because they are the same species, could mate and produce this tiger here. Okay, cool, so subspecies are used to delineate differences within a species. That's all well and good. But now let's take a look at this pig. It's a Vietnamese pot-bellied pig, or Sus scrofa domesticus, and here is an American Yorkshire pig, which I think we can all agree looks pretty different from the other pig. But even though they look very different, they aren't just part of the same species, they're part of the same subspecies of Suscrofa domesticus. But clearly these two things are not the same, so we call them different breeds or any number of other names that have no real scientific definition, and now we're subdividing our subdivisions into a biological mess where the divisions have no standardized definition and it's all very unclear. It turns out it's very difficult to take the amazing number of organisms we have on Earth and find any kind of reasonable way of organizing them into categories. In the second half of the 18th century, the director of the Jardin du Roi Botanical Gardens in Paris, Georges-Louis Buffon, was tackling a similar issue. Buffon was assembling a massive collection of living and dead plants and animals for research, so as part of that process, he had to name all of these different organisms and place them somewhere within a taxonomical system. But then he had this problem where he kept receiving animals that appeared to be between two different species, so then where do you place them? Based on appearance alone, there isn't any good way of delineating where one species ends and another begins, so he began to use a test. The test goes like this. In order for two organisms to be considered part of the same species, they had to be able to reproduce, and then their offspring had to be fertile, meaning that their offspring could reproduce as well. This is the definition of what a species is that is still taught in many schools, and it makes sense because it helps do away with the pesky problem of hybrids. It's confusing when we have this idea that two animals must be separate species, such as horses and donkeys, because they just look different. But horses can mate with donkeys and create this new thing, this new animal that is neither horse nor donkey, which in this case we call a mule. And there are lots of these things popping up, from the Zorse to the Camel Llama to the Liger, but under Buffon's definition we can write these things off as freaks of nature. They aren't fertile, they can't reproduce themselves, so they are really just temporary accidents of nature, not new species. Except later on Buffon did experiments with mules and found something astonishing. He found that some mules, specifically some female mules, are fertile and can produce offspring. That's crazy. It turns out that some hybrids can reproduce just fine, and many hybrids are stronger and healthier than either of their parent species. These aren't sickly mistakes of nature, these are new animals. Some hybrids can reproduce with other hybrids of the same type, eventually creating a new species altogether, as appears to be the case with the American red wolf, the hybrid descendant of gray wolves and coyotes. Also lemons. Lemons are a hybrid, no joke. Or even more astonishingly, as is the case of the mule, if you have a a fertile female mule who then mates with a male horse, and their offspring then mate with more horses and so on, now you have donkey DNA being spread throughout the whole horse population. It wouldn't take that many generations before all horses in a population would be some part donkey. If very different species can produce fertile offspring, Buffon had to conclude that species as we imagine them simply don't exist. In his own words, Buffon says, in general, the more one increases one's divisions, in the case of natural products, the nearer one comes to the truth, since in reality individuals exist alone in nature while genera, orders, classes, exist only in our imagination. Buffon was doing his work well before Darwin came along, but his conclusion does fit well within the modern Darwinian understanding, in that we can't think of life as these neat categories that never overlap, because life is instead an evolutionary continuum of ancestry and descent. This whole discussion is what biologists refer to as the species problem, where there is no ubiquitous or even reasonable way of defining what a species is, and biologists disagree if species 
species even exist in any kind of real way. That's not to say it isn't useful to lump organisms that look similar into categories. It certainly is. But we should remember that the things we see around us are not permanent, separate categories, but rather constantly changing and interacting. Where we'd like to see difference, there is often a surprising degree of similarity, all the way down to a DNA level, because in the end, even though we look very different, all living things share a common ancestor that binds us. I'll see you next time. The result of this is that only the fastest among the cheetahs and gazelles live long enough to reproduce. That's what we call selection pressure. We can beat the bees. The average weight for a honeybee is 90 milligrams. The average weight for an American adult male is 189 pounds.